Okay, thank you all for coming. So this talk is going to be generally looking at how, how sloths, giant ground sloths, change as they, as they age from very small little baby sloths to the big things that could maybe reach the top of this room when they stand up. So I'm going to be focusing on two sloths mainly, Megalonyx, which is what they've, the, gen the, the genus that they found at the Tarkio site, and is what Rusty is downstairs, and then another genus called Paramylodon that was also walking around at the same time as Megalonyx. And I'll go into some more details about what exactly those are as we go through. So I'm going to start off with just a quick introduction to sloths in general, because they're Part, sloths themselves are extremely interesting and in a lot of cases extremely weird and the group that they're part of and their close relatives are the same way. So sloths are part of a mammalian group called Xenarthra, which includes the modern sloth, the two-toed sloth and the three-toed sloth, and anteaters and armadillos. And there are also two extinct Xenarthrans, one called a Glyptodont. This was, you can see people back there for scale, so this was basically a walking Volkswagen bug that just had walked around in its armor. And then these little things called Pampatheres, which are very similar in, in, um, in appearance to, to armadillos. Now, Xenarthra has several characteristics that make them different from other mammals. So the word, the word sloth tend, means very slow. So Xenarthrans tend to be kind of slow. And they also have a, a low body temperature compared to other mammals. So one of the reasons that you often hear you maybe don't want to eat armadillo or touch armadillos is because some of them can carry leprosy. That's because an armadillo's body temperature is lower than a human's body temperature. It's about the same temperature as the outside of our skin, which is a very nice environment for the leprosy bacteria. And the, the northern their teeth also have no enamel. So the reason we get cavities is because bacteria secrete acids which start eating into the hard enamel on our teeth. The so northerns don't have enamel. They just have the softer dentin underneath that. Now the dentin is harder than our dentin is, but they still don't have that enamel. <clears throat> but the main thing that makes them unique among mammals is what gives the group their name, Xenarthra. Xenarthra literally means strange joints. And that refers to some joints in their backbones. So this is the spine of an armadillo. And at first glance, it looks very similar to any other mammalian spine you might see. So if we compare it to a human spine or any other mammalian spine, you can see that our vertebrae articulate at the top and the bottom, or if you're a quadrupedal animal, the front and the back, on these articular facets. And then when they come together, you have them articulating at the tops of the vertebra. And then you have that nice, smooth vertebral body on the side. And most mammals are like this, with just this one pair of, articula of articul articulation points at the front and the back. And if you look at the top of this, of this armadillo spine, you can see those articulation facets, the exact same that we have. But when you look at the side view, you can see right down there on the side of the spine is another set of articulation facets. And that's, what, that's called the xenarthrus facet, so the, the strange joint. And what that does is it makes their spine much, much more rigid. And they think that the reason for that is that a lot of armadillos and anteaters, they use their, they have big claws and they'll dig a lot. And so, so some people think that this evolved because that would help stabilize their spine when they're doing all that vigorous digging. Now how xenarthrans are related to each other is um, armadillos are on the outside and that Singulata, this includes the glyptodonts and the pampatheas that are extinct. And then anteaters and sloths are the most closely related to each other among the xenarthrans. So 
vermin lingua, so worm tongue. Think of an anteater sticking its tongue out into an anthill. And then sloths are called either called phylophagia or tardigr tardigrata. Now, sloths themselves. Um, modern sloths don't have a lot of variation among them. They are very, they live suspensory lifestyles like this guy. They literally spend almost all of their life hanging from a tree upside down. And that's, that's kind of unique. There isn't really any other animals that lives like that. They do, they will come out of the trees about once a week or so to use the little sloth's room. But other than that, they spend, uh, they spend pretty much their entire lives hanging from the trees. Or sometimes they might, be, they might be clinging to the side of a tree. Now the two types of sloths that are currently around are the two-toed sloth. So you can see them hanging. And you can see very, you can see very clearly the two, to the two toes, the two front toes it has. And then the three-toed sloth which looks kind of like a bank robber and also very clearly has three toes on its front, on its front, of, on its front appendage. And you can see this one crawling around, so it, that one may have just done its business, not sure. But when they, they are not well adapted to being on the ground. When they are on the ground, they pretty much have to crawl like this. They're much, much better walking um, out in the trees like this. And they can actually get to some speed when they're hanging in the trees like this. Not, near, not as fast as and you might think an animal running, but maybe faster than you think a sloth might be able to move. But that is not anywhere near the diversity that sloths used to have. These are various groups of giant ground sloths. This is a megalonychid, a, actually a megalonyx. It's not the same species as Rusty, but it's very closely related. There's another one called megatheres, which these are the really, really big ones, where when I said when they stand on their hind legs and they might be able to touch the ceiling, I, was, I wasn't exaggerating. And then there's some other ones called mylodontids. This is what paramylodon is part of. And then another group called no no nothrothers. This is specifically um, a specimen called thalassochnus that they think was actually an aquatic sloth that have, may have had a lifestyle similar to a manatee or a dugong that would have swam around the shallow seas and ate seagrass. So they have lots and lots of variation compared to today. But most people. When they think of sloths, if they know about the giant ground sloths, they think there's the modern tree sloths and the big terrestrial ground sloths. But there's actually also an extinct group in the middle. There were intermediate sized sloths as well. So these are just a few examples. They, these sloths lived um, lots of them in the Caribbean. So we have lots of specimens of these from, his, from the island of Hispaniola, so the Dominican Republic, Haiti, um, Cuba, we have specimens from. Some of them lived in South America. But they, you can tell they're bigger than modern sloths, and, but they're not anywhere near the size of the giant ground sloths. But these are obviously not suspensory hanging creatures. So the idea is that these intermediate sized sloths may have been um, semi-arboreal. So they may have been running around on the ground sometimes or also running around in the trees sometimes. And trying to parse that out is what part of my research is, is um, part, part of my research does. So what, uh, what started this whole project is this is the the discovery of the ground of the ground sloths in the Tarkio Valley that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And this is just a picture of that. How these sloths were discovered was I believe it was in was it in 2001? Yeah, in 2001, the, uh, the farmer who owns this land was walking along the river, and he saw a big bone sticking out of, out of the riverbank. And he immediately realized that this looks like a very weird bone. So he dug it out and brought it to the museum here to be identified, and it turned out it was a giant sloth femur, so your, your thigh bone. And it's, they're very, very distinctive. So if you, if you know what you're looking at, you immediately know it belongs to a sloth. And that led to a several year long excavation of diverting the river and lots of digging in the mud to find what eventually turned out to be three sloths. They had, they had the adult, which was what the femur belonged to, which is one of, if not the most complete ground, um, megalonyx that we have found. Then they found a juvenile along with the adult. And then they found a smaller juvenile with them. So we had an adult, a kid, and a baby, they call them, which is very, very exciting. However, the only 
piece of the skeleton that they have of all three individuals is the shoulder blade, so the scapula. This is the adult shoulder blade. The, um, the other one is in several pieces, so I'm not really using that one. And this is the juve these, the, these belong to the juvenile, so the first juvenile they found. And this is the little baby. So you can see much, much smaller, but also in much, much worse condition. So the idea was, can we use the shoulder blade, um, basically the shape of the shoulder blade, to learn anything about these animals? How does, what can we learn about, say, their lifestyle from changes in shape of the shoulder blade as, the, as ground sloths grow older? Now, another sloth was also found at that site, which is uh, paramylodon. So that's one of the mylodons. But they just found this uh, fifth metacarpal. And um, a metacarpal is one of your long toe bones. So it wasn't found in the exact same spot as the megalonyx, as the family. But it shows that at least around the same time, it's unclear exactly how close in time they were, you had these two very different types, not very different, but these two different types of ground sloths in about the same place. Show your Iowa pride, the Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. The ultimate collection of Iowa Hawkeye merchandise, gifts, and apparel. Help support the University of Iowa. All proceeds benefit men's and women's athletic teams and student programs. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. Show your Iowa pride. Call 1-800-HAWK-SHOP or visit www.hawkshop.com. We have a certain way of doing things. You'll see it in the determination of our students, in the classroom and on our fields, in the collaboration among our faculty that lead to great innovation and change, in the vision of our writers, artists, and doctors, bringing the world to Iowa and Iowa to the world. It's the Hawkeye way. Now when we look at the relationships of sloths in general, you can see all these families that I showed the pictures of earlier. And Megalonyx is part of the family Megalonychidae, which is up here. And that also includes the modern two-toed sloth, Colopus. Paramylodon is part of this group called Mylodontidae. And you can see that Megalonychidae and Mylodontidae they share a common ancestor very, very, very far down the tree. That means that as far as sloths go, megalonyx and paramylodon are not closely related. They are very, very distantly related. And then the modern three-toed sloth is all out by itself. So that actually provide, that's actually another little bit of a mystery, is the two modern sloths, they have 
that same unique suspensory lifestyle. They look very, very similar, but at least as far as sloths goes, they are about as distantly related as you can possibly get. So how they actually both came upon that lifestyle is, is currently people are research, re researching that. And it, it is a bit of a mystery. But as far as this talk goes, the main thing to keep in mind is that, is that megalonyx and paramylodon, even though they're both big sloths, are not very closely related. So we'll give you a quick intro to these two groups in general. So the first is megalonyx jeffersonii, and this is rusty downstairs. And you can see a picture of its skull. This is from the, um, I, from, uh, the museum at Idaho State University. And you can see they're fairly big. And megalonyx has generally been reconstructed as more of a browser. That means it generally eats more leaves from trees and shrubs and things like that. And as such, Rusty is pulling down a leaf, to a tree branch, to eat the leaves off of it. Now, megalonyx jeffersonii is actually very, very important in vertebrate paleontology in general because it was actually the it, it was actually the focus of the, the very first publication in vertebrate paleontology in the United States, which was written by Thomas Jefferson. So this, the, this is the actual, the actual publication by Thomas Jefferson. And it's got, it's hard to read sometimes, like the S's look like F's. So that, can, that, that throws me off when I'm trying to read this sometimes. But the story behind this was some, some people found this claw. And Jefferson actually thought that this was the claw of a giant lion. So he called it megalonyx, which means giant claw. And, he, and this publication actually talks about it being a really, really big cat. But then they sent the, they sent the pieces off to Europe. And a man named Georges Cuvier, who was one of the a French anatomists, who was legendary in the field, if you gave him pretty much any animal bone, he could look at it and tell you what it is. He realized this, these were actually sloth bones. And um, one of the, when, uh, when Jefferson sent, sent Lewis and Clark out on their great expedition, one of the directives was, find these animals, because they must be around somewhere. Unfortunately, they were long gone by that point. But, but Megalonyx Jeffersonii is still the, the first published um, American, American fossil. And it was very, very widely distributed. So we have found megalonic specimens from all the way down in Central America to all the way up to the Arctic. So it was going all over the place. So it was living, and it, it was living during um, a time of lot, lots and lots of climate change. They had glaciers coming in and coming out. So it would have been moving along with the climate, but it was very, very, very widespread. Now, the other sloth that we found at the Tarkio site is Paramylodon harleni. And this is one of, one of the other very common giant ground sloths from North America. And you can see its skull looks, looks kind of different from the megalonic skull. Its, lit, its um, lower jaw is protruding out some more. And, but overall, its body shape is fairly similar. And this is the publication from, uh, from Paramylodon. You can see that it came out in 1903. So this is another spe specimen that we've known about it for a very, very long time, but not quite as long as the 1700s with Thomas Jefferson. And this is some of the earliest fossils of Paramylodon that we found. You can see that lip just jutting out. And Paramylodon is also quite widely distributed. Not as widely distributed as Megalonyx is, but still, down in Central America, all the way up, up into Canada. Now, it is, it is entirely possible that, megalon that Paramylodon had just as widespread a distribution as Megalonyx, and we just haven't found the fossils for it. But as things stand now, it's not quite as, as widely distributed as Megalonyx, but still, still, it's, it's all over the place. Actually, a lot of, a good amount of the fossils that we pull out of the La Brea tar pits from down here are actually paramylodon. They have shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves and I can keep going of shelves of paramylodon fossils that they pulled out. I have looked through them and gotten very, very dirty from those tar-covered fossils. Okay, so those are the two main sloths that I'm researching right now. 
Now we'll give you a quick introduction into a, the scapula in general. So the scapula is your shoulder blade. And it has three, it has a few basic parts of it. The, the blade of the scapula, where lots of the muscles attach to it, and the spine of the scapula. So if you feel, if you ever feel behind your back, when you feel you're coming out here to your shoulder, that is the spine of your scapula. So you actually feel that. And you can see how, how in humans our scapula articulates with our humerus. So you have your shoulder joint right there, a nice ball and socket joint. So that is what's going on when you do this. And then your collarbone, your clavicle, that comes in and also articulates with your scapula. So when you feel, so if anyone has bony shoulders like I do, you can feel that articulation point right there. And the scapula is actually extremely important for muscles in our back. It is the anchor point for all, for all of the muscles that are part of the rotator cuff. So there you have um, this muscle called the supraspinatus, which starts here and then goes up and attaches onto your arm. So when somebody says they have a torn rotator cuff, it is generally the tendon for this muscle is torn. So what this muscle does is it contracts, and you can imagine a muscle that comes from here and goes to there contracting, and that, what, that's what raises your arm up. So, well, that's what starts to raise your arm up. So when someone has a torn rotator cuff, they have a really hard time starting to raise their muscle, their arm. Once, you're, once your arm gets up here, then your deltoid muscle, so if, any, if you have muscular shoulders, you can feel that, that starts raising your arm. But if you have, have a torn rotator cuff, you have a, you have a problem. And then there are various other muscles involved with pulling your arm back or bringing it back, things like that. Um, but one of the muscles that is actually very, very relevant to sloths is this muscle called teres major. It, it, um, it attaches to this, this um, inferior angle of the scapula, so at the very bottom, and it comes out and attaches to your arm, to your humerus. And you can actually see that right here if it wasn't cut off. So you can see that. And now imagine just it keeps going, and it would attach to the arm. That muscle is responsible. So when your arm is out here, it brings it back. So if you are an animal that, say, digs a lot, when you do this, you're going to have that muscle is going to be very, very well developed. And you can see various other muscles on the scapula that attach to the shoulder joint. And for the most part, this is what these muscles are what help keep your shoulder actually, keep your arm actually attached into your shoulder. And here's some other, you can see them flexed. So your, this muscle here raises your arm up, and then this deltoid muscle starts taking advantage. And then there are other muscles that actually come up from the top of the scapula and go up into your neck. Those are the muscles that help you shrug. It's like, what does that muscle do? I don't know. seconds to go, Hartley to Cook, and the Hawks have the lead. Tradition. Mm -hmm. Ambition. Exploration. Inspiration. You feel it when you step on campus at the University of Iowa. The energy and pride of students inspired by our history. And excited about our future. When you join the Hawkeye family, you're a part of it all. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a Hawkeye. Show your Iowa pride. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. The ultimate collection of Iowa Hawkeye merchandise, gifts, and apparel. Help support the University of Iowa. 
All proceeds benefit men's and women's athletic teams and student programs. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. Show your Iowa pride. Call 1-800-HAWK-SHOP or visit www.hawkshop.com. What difference does tradition make? In 125 years, the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy has come to symbolize unsurpassed education and training, the highest quality patient care, the pursuit of new knowledge through discovery, the quest to enhance human health, a foundation of excellence for the challenges of tomorrow. The University of Iowa College of Pharmacy, celebrating the past, shaping the future. Now, sloth scapula. They are weird as far as scapula go. So the th but they do have some general things that aren't quite we weird. So you can see right here, this little uh, extra shelf, this is where that teres major muscle would attach. Now in, um, in humans, if we go back, see that? We, uh, you see a little bit, but it's pretty much the same. There's not very much variation. On sloths, there is a very, very deep attachment point for that muscle. So these animals were using that teres major muscle quite a bit. Now the weird thing about sloth scapula is this. So remember you have that spine on your scapula, and then you have something else called a coracoid process. In, um, this used to be actually a separate bone, but in mammals it actually evolved to just fuse to the scapula and now it's just a little nub sticking off of it. And you have various, mu various muscles will attach to this, to this coracoid process as well. But You can see here is the, here's that end of, that, of the spine, and there's the coracoid process, and there is a space between them. And this is the case in all mammals, except for sloths. They have a bridge between those called the coracoacromial arch. And it's really weird. The only, the only other reference I've been able to find of any other animal that has this arch is a bat in New Zealand, a little small bat in New Zealand. So we're not entirely sure what this arch is for or why they all evolved it. And all sloths have this arch, except for the modern three-toed sloth. They have a scapula that's more similar to ours. So that's Sloths are, have this weird thing in their scapula, and then you have one other type of sloth that decides it doesn't want to be weird, which is in itself pretty weird. And you can see here how the sloth actually articulates, on, how the scapula actually articulates on a sloth specimen. So you have the arm, so it's more on a sloth, the, the, and most other quadrupedal animals, the scapula is more, um, more on its side, whereas in a human, it's more, or in a primate, it's more going up and down. And the, the humerus will come in here and then hook, um, touch onto that little arch a little bit. And then you can see its shoulder, its um, collarbone, hooks in at the exact same place that it would for us. But it's just that arch that is weird. And the other Xenarthrins also have very, very strange shoulder blades. This is an anteater shoulder blade. So there's, it's one spine, and then it's got another spine. When I, first, when I first saw this, and I was trying to take my measurements, I had no idea what to do, because I had, I had no idea what was going on there. And it took me a few days before I actually found what was going on here. And remember that, that shelf on the megalonyx scapula for that teres major muscle? That's what that is. So anteaters, you can think of them just digging into the, into the ant piles or the termite mounds, and they do that a lot. And they're able to do that because of that big muscle. And armadillos also have a very, very well-developed attachment site for that teres major muscle. That in this case, they look kind of like a big sickle. So xenarthrins like to dig a lot or do something else that makes them go like that. So now we can, so now that we've actually gone over some of the scapula, the features of the scapula in general, we can look at a little more in depth of the megalonic scapula as it grows older. So you can see here in this, ba in this, um, this baby, the baby specimen, it's 
got, it's already got a pretty well established shelf for that teres major muscle. So that means that when these ground sloths were very, very young, they, were, they must have already been doing something that had them use their arms quite a bit. Now what that something was is a little harder to say. There could be several things. It's possible they were digging. It's possible that they were using, they might have been using that muscle to kind of brace themselves to hold on to their parents. Like say, um, like bears do. You'll see the cubs just riding around on their mom's back. So it's pop, maybe they were doing something like that. It's, it's very, very difficult to say. And then you can see in the juvenile, it's also got the older juvenile, it also has still that, that shelf. And then in the adult, it's still there, but it is relatively smaller. It's not taking up as much space on the scapula as the baby. So maybe whatever these young, these very young ground sloths were using this muscle for, that may have declined in importance as they got, as they got older. And in a paramyelodon scapula, you see much the same thing. You can see there is that shelf for the teres major. And there it is. It's smaller and not quite as prominent as in the megalonyx. And you can also see that just the, the paramyelodon scapula in general is a different shape than the megalonyx scapula. This is much more arrow shaped, much more angular, whereas this paramyelodon scapula is much rounder. So that means there must have been some difference in shape of the muscles that were using these two facets that were attached to those two facets, which again may indicate some difference in behavior between these two kinds of sloths. Now you might be thinking, well, what can we actually find out from shoulder blades? And the answer is quite a bit. So one of the first things that occurred to me when I started this project is ground sloths, as you can see by the size of that baby shoulder blade, baby ground sloths are quite small, whereas adult ground sloths are very, very big which means that when you have such, such a huge discrepancy in size, maybe they had differences in behavior. So I was thinking it might be possible that these baby ground sloths may have been semi-arboreal. Maybe they were running up into the trees when they were very, very small. Maybe to get away from predators or something like that. Even though there's no way to test that, but that's a possibility. And this, this looking at the shape of the shoulder blade to see how much an animal can go in the, can, goes in the trees has been done. Um, in this case, it's been done in primates. So you see here, these are various shapes of different scapulae. And on this chart, on this side, are terrestrial apes. So things like gorillas and chimpanzees that spend most of their time on the ground. And on this side are the more arboreal monkeys that spend a lot of their time running around in the trees. And you can see, very, you can see a, very diff a very noticeable difference in shape of the shoulder blades between these two groups of primates. And in the middle there are orangutans. And orangutans are weird, so we're not going to worry about that. But the point is, is that in primates, you can use the shape of the scapula to figure something out about how terrestrial or arboreal they are. And this has actually been used um, with our own ancestors as well. <coughs> In, this, in, in these two very busy charts, you have on this side are humans down here, and then you have some chimpanzees over here, and then you've got some gorillas over here. And right in the middle, these are Austra Australopithecines, which is Lucy, if you've heard of that, which this is showing us that while, Austra while Lucy was walking around on hind legs, was bipedal, they were still climbing around in the trees more than we could based on the shape of their shoulder blade. So they were tr truly an intermediate between, between modern humans and the apes. And here you can also see this, this uh, triangle right in the middle. That's another Australopithecine. And that square that's mixed right in with the humans, that is a specimen from a Homo erectus specimen. So Homo erectus was much more closer to humans than the Australopithecines, which was still right in the middle. So the shape of the shoulder blade seems to be very, very indicative of arboreality. So that is the main thing I was trying to investigate. And how I actually did that is using a method called morphometrics, which morph, morph means shape. Metric is to measure, so to measure the shape of something. And there are 
to, uh, to gather the data, I use this machine called a microscribe. And you can see it's kind of got an arm on a swivel stick. So what it does is you just turn the arm, and it goes all over the place, and you push the button. And it gives you XYZ coordinates. And then you can take all those coordinates and put them in a computer, and the computer does various things. You can make um, what, what this machine was actually originally designed for was animators to use. So they could take, take coordinates of, say, a car or a model face or something like that and then put them into the computer program and make a digital copy of it. And then science decided to use it for our own things. Now the analysis that we actually use for this is something called um, Procrustes. And that has to do with um, measuring the shape of it. Why it's called Procrustes is it's, um, it's um, named after the story of a Greek bandit named Procrustes. And according to the story, what he would do is he, would, he had his house on a hill, and he would look for someone coming, and he had this bed. And he said, and when he saw a traveler coming by, he would say, if you get on this bed and you are the same size, I will give you a whole bunch of money. But this bed could change size. So if he saw someone tall coming, he would make the bed shorter. If he saw someone short coming, he would make the bed longer. And then when they were not the same size as the bed, he would kill them and rob them. So the idea behind Procrustes is that it can, take the, it can, ta it can deal with differences in size in measurements. So let's say we wanted to examine the measurements between a beaver skull and an elephant skull. The main thing, the main difference you're going to get between those skulls, between those measurements, are just sheer size. What Procrustes does is it mathematically factors out the size differences. So all, you're, all you are dealing with is the shape measurements, which comes in handy when you're comparing, say, a little tree sloth scapula to a giant ground sloth scapula, some of which are literally the size of my torso. Think shoulder blade that big. So you want to factor size out. And then the typical mathematical analyses, PCA is something called a principal component analysis. And what that does is it just it measures the differences in your various data sets. And a regression just finds a best fit line between your data points. And I'll show you what all this is later. What is the Iowa experience? A scenic campus world-class education, extraordinary professors, exciting Big Ten sports, a thriving art scene, lifelong friends. Experience Iowa for yourself. Call 1-800-553-4692 or visit uiowa.edu. of history, University of Iowa Photo Service. From Hawkeye legends to iconic visuals of the Iowa campus, the greatest images of the University of Iowa. Call 1-800-369-IOWA or 319-335-2561. University of Iowa Photo Service, located in Seashore Hall. Visit us online at uiphotos.info.
So what I did with that microscribe was I took my various landmarks around the edge of the scapula. Now you might notice that there's no landmarks here, even though I already made a really big fuss about how weird this, this, um, this, this spine is. And the reason for that is because in a lot of specimens, especially the juvenile specimens that you saw, is this is broken off. Shoulder blades in general are very, very fragile bones. Is that this, in some, in some animals, some smaller animals, this part right here can be almost paper thin. So they tend, when, <clears throat> through the process of fossilization, shoulder blades tend to get broken quite easily. So most of the specimens I've been using don't have this. So in the specimens that do have this, I have taken dip measurements around it. But I haven't actually done anything with that yet because most of the specimens don't have it. And I'm also taking measurements around the shoulder joint. So this is called the glenoid fossa. And remember, this is where the head of your humerus actually articulates. It's where your shoulder joint is. So this is where your arm is rotating around when you go like that. So remember I said that some people think of sloths as only in the trees or only on the ground. And then we have these intermediate ones that might have been running up and that might have been semi-arboreal, so on the trees and the ground. So when I put all these, all the, all the shoulder blade measurements into, 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 those, um, into those programs and, and analyses I just mentioned, they come out very, very different. This group right here, these blue dots, these are the modern tree sloths. So remember, even though the two-toed sloth and the three-toed sloth are not at all closely related, they still have very, very similar shoulder blades, which is most likely because they are both hanging from the trees. Now these triangles are the big guys, the giant ground sloths, and they're in their own spot in the chart. And then you have these squares, which are the few intermediate sloths that I have measured. So you have tree sloths, ground sloths, and then the intermediate sloths seem to be up here. So I, have, um, so I do have some data from some more interme intermediate sloths that I haven't put into this yet, and I'm hoping that they will fall out here as well. But there generally seems to be a good separation between the shapes of the shoulder blades of tree sloths and ground sloths and some of these other sloths that may have been semi-arboreal. And you can see some definite differences in the shape. Here in the tree sloths, that glenoid fossa, is much, much shallower. It's almost, it's almost a straight line. Whereas these giant ground sloths, that glenoid fossa is much, much deeper. And I would expect that the reason for that is they are giant animals that are putting all their weight on their arms. So they need to have, they need just to have that much deeper area for their arm to sit in. <clears throat> so now let's just look quickly again at the differences between this megalonyx scapula and the paramyelodon scapula because those are the, gonna be the two that we're focusing on. So we have here this general differences in this angle here. So we have more round here, more angular here. We've got differences in this, in this spot for the teres major muscle, that muscle that's pulling your arm back. In megalonyx, it seems to be a little larger, and in paramyelodon, not quite as large. And one other difference is the spine is in a little different position between them, which is making this this part right here, it's, a, it's called the infraspinous fossa, is relatively smaller in paramyelodon, and the, this, the supraspinous fossa, so above the spine, is relatively larger. Whereas in this megalo megalonyx, they are, gen they are about the same. So again, this indicates that these muscles would have been shaped differently in these two sloths, which may, which may indicate differences in behavior. Now let's add in the juveniles and see what happens since the title of this talk is Changes in Sloths as They Grow Older. So remember I was thinking that maybe these juvenile sloths, these little baby sloths, maybe they, maybe they are a little semi-arboreal. And in some, that might be the case. <clears throat> so this chart is kind of flipped from the other one, but it's still showing the same relationships. Is you have the tree sloths up here, the and then the purple are going to be these, the giant ground sloths. Now when you see these triangles and squares, those are the juveniles, those are the little guys, and then the circles are going to be the adults. When you look at megalonyx, which we found at Tarkio, 
there the juveniles are clustered very, very close to the adults, except for that one, which might be an anomaly. Whereas with the mylodonts, so these are mostly going to be paramylodon, the juveniles are mainly down here, and the adults are mainly on this side. So it's not a perfectly clean separation. There is some overlap, which when you have this many specimens is what you would expect. But there seems to be much, much more variation and difference between the, the mylodon juveniles and the mylodon adults versus the megalonyx juveniles and the megalonyx adults. So it looks like that the shape of megalonyx doesn't quite change as much as paramylodon does as it grows older, which again may indicate changes in behavior. It's possible that maybe the paramylodon juveniles had a much, much, diff much different behavior, behavioral aspect than the adults, and maybe the juvenile megalonyx were closer to the behavior of the adults. It's, um, it's difficult to say. Well, impossible to say, but those are some possibilities. Now, when we look at just megalonyx and paramylodon by themselves, they come out very, very different. So these, the red is going to be the megalonyx, and the blue is the paramylodon. So again, the circles are going to be the adults, and the squares are going to be the juveniles. So the juveniles are very clearly on this side, and the adults are over here. So you have adults are quite different from juveniles, and megalonyx is quite different from paramylodon, in general. And here you can see this Terry's major fossa is again in the juveniles is, um, is much bigger um, much bigger generally than in these adults. It's taking up relatively more space in the scapula. And then here you can see again the, the difference in orientation of the spine. So we have obviously paramylodon and megalonyx are different as they grow old, as they grow older, and from each other. But the question is, how are they changing shape as they grow older? And you can examine that through something called allometry. So allometry means you change, in, you change shape or ratios as you change in size. Isometry means that you, you stay, the shape stays the same as you change in size. So an example of that is in humans. We have very allometric growth. Here is a fetus eight weeks after fertilization. It looks like a big-headed alien. Now just imagine if we kept these same proportions as we grew older. That would be what we, had, what we would be like if we had isometric growth, if we had the same proportions as we got bigger in size. So my head would be like, our heads would be like that. But we don't. We grow allometrically as we change our proportions as we grow, as we, as we get bigger. So what we need to see is do these sloths in their shoulder blades, do they show allometry when they're growing or do they show isometry when they're growing? And that can tell us something. And the answer should be fairly obvious if you already saw the pictures. The baby sloth scapula was a very, very different shape from the adult scapula. So you can see this, this slope here these are showing allometry. So they are changing in shape as they grow older. And these lines, so this blue line is how paramylodon is changing. And this red line is how megalonyx is changing. So these are just, these are just regression lines. They're best fit lines through all the data points. And then this black line is just the average line. So there is definite allometry in both of them. And we can make it a little easier to look at by putting all of the points on those lines. And again, they look, they're going about the same direction. And when you actually do various statistical tests on these two growth lines, it shows that they are, they are going in the exact same direction. They look a little different, but statistically, they're the same. So that's... That is interesting, because remember that megalonyx and paramylodon, so I didn't put it in there. I meant to put another clade, the, the evolutionary tree there, but remember that megalonyx and paramylodon are not closely related. They, are, they, sh they have a common ancestor way, way, way back in, way far back. But even though they have, they have different shapes, they are still changing shape in the same way. 
So you can think of that. Imagine, say, you had a triangle here and a square there. And up in this part of the graph were circles. So as the triangle would move up here, it would, its edges would get more rounded. And as a square moves up here, its edges would also get more rounded. So they would still be different shapes, but they are changing shape in the same way. So the, there are two possible explanations for that. Is one is that that is how ancestral sloths grew and changed their shape, and they just retained that. But I think that's kind of unlikely, considering how distantly related they are. The more likely explanation is that they just they have to change this way because of how big they are. When you get to be a certain size, there are only so many ways that your bones can actually handle that size. So if you think of, say, the leg of an elephant and the leg of a sauropod dinosaur, they're both pretty much pillar-shaped because they're both so large. So once you start getting, once you start getting big enough, Evolution can only find so many engineering ways to handle that size, and which means it is going to come. It is going to use the same solution multiple multiple times, even in even in groups that are not related to each other. And what this what this lines also shows is there's a definite definite gradient between different sizes. So what we might be able to do is if we find another scapula, is we can. Put it in this. Put it in. Put it in this analysis. See where it falls out on this line, and maybe get an idea of how old that sloth is. Show your Iowa pride, the Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. The ultimate collection of Iowa Hawkeye merchandise, gifts, and apparel. Help support the University of Iowa. All proceeds benefit men's and women's athletic teams and student programs. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. Show your Iowa pride. Call 1-800-HAWK-SHOP or visit www.hawkshop.com. So the conclusions from what I've done so far is the, the shoulder blades, the shape of the shoulder blades seems to be indicative of whether or not it's an arboreal sloth or a ground sloth or somewhere in the middle, a semi-arboreal sloth. And then Megalonyx and Paramylodon, they're both ground sloths, but they both have, even though they have different shapes of shoulder blades and even though they are distantly related, they still change shape in the same way, which is, likely due to just constraints on their large size. And Megalonyx, it seems to be more constrained in general as it grows older than Paramylodon, which seems to have more wide, more wide range in shapes. Now, one, one possibility for this is if you noticed, there were a lot more blue dots than there were red dots. So remember I said the La Brea Tar Pits has lots and lots and lots and lots of shelves? That's why there are so many blue dots. So my sample size for Megalonyx is not as big as my sample size for Paramylodon. It is possible that this conclusion could change when I get more Megalonyx specimens. But for right now, it seems to be Megalonyx is more constrained than Paramylodon. And lots of people helped me get, um, get uh, specimens for this. 
Lots of people have given me advice on this. There's no way I would be able to do any of this on my own. And um, lots of the, most of the funding for this project has actually been paid directly from the, from the University of Iowa's uh, I guess Earth and Environmental Science <laughs> Department now. So that should be changed to Earth and Environmental Science. But so the department has funded most of this, uh, most of this, most of this work, and I wouldn't be able to have done that without them at all, without them as well. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Megalovics is mm -hmm. flat Yes. Uh, which indicates it was bipedal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. You think this was a wide That very well may be. So one of the one of the things that so remember I mentioned that they have the differences in for these muscles is that might that might have to do with moving the arm around more. Whereas and if we look at Rusty, like I said, they show Megalonyx being more of a browser. So Megalonyx would have been using its arms more like this. Whereas uh, paramyelodon has often been shown, has been, been constructed to be more of a grazer, so more eating grass. So it seems likely that paramyelodon may have been spending more time walking on all fours and megalonyx more time with its arms up. So that could, be, that, that could um, explain some of the differences in shape. Yes, Dan. The core chromial arch, mm -hmm. you called it? Yes. The, um, are there any attachment points visible on that for muscles? Yes, yes, there are. The, so the muscles that, let's go back to the scapula diagram. There are absolutely muscle attachment points. So you can see here a lot of this muscle. Let's see, not on there. So you can see here you have the deltoid muscle um, attaching a lot on the spine. And also your, um, your trapezius muscle, which is right here, also attaches on your spine in, in, um, in at least the modern sloth that has this spine, which is just the two-tilled sloth. These attachments just extend down a little farther. So the... Uh, My thought was that with all those different attachment points, it's mm -hmm. a very busy bone. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of forces acting on it. Mm -hmm. it. It makes sense that it needs some extra mm -hmm. structural enhancement for any mm -hmm. forces that are acting. Mm -hmm. Right. So potentially, but then no other no other large animal has developed that that structure, which is why if it was if it was if that if that if it provided a lot like significant extra stability in that joint, you would expect it to have to evolve multiple times, okay. but but we don't see that 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 is, that is a possibility that that may, maybe sloths were just the only ones to ever happen upon. That evolutionary, that that uh, okay. that advantage, but we're still not entirely sure why they have it. Yeah. Yes, yes. So the, the the one bat in New Zealand, which you said also mm -hmm. shares that same thing, mm -hmm. um, maybe shares with sloths the fact with these sloths the fact that mm -hmm. it's drastically changed its life habit from its ancestors. So mm -hmm. the, the one bat in New Zealand is much mm -hmm. more terrestrial and much less flying. The, is it? Yes. Okay. Other bats. Yeah, I don't, act, I don't actually know anything about that bat. Yeah, I just so, found that one reference. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. whether that, that weird structure is mm -hmm. not itself an adaptation, mm -hmm. but something that's happening as it's evolving mm -hmm. and adapting to the environment mm -hmm. and changing its behavior. Maybe. Something like that. That's, uh, I think I'm going to talk to you more about that bat and look into that. Anything else? Yeah. Have you looked at any um, living thing where we know like the juveniles spend more time in the trees and the adults spend more time on the ground compared to the size of the trees? Um, I do have, I, I'm also measuring bear shoulder blades because so think about you have some, some bears um, go up in the trees more and more the cubs. So bears also have that same Terry's major shelf that you saw in the sloths. So I am actually measuring um, bear shoulder blades to see how they compare to these giant sloth shoulder blades. I just haven't um, put them into the analysis yet. So that'll be, that'll actually be kind of interesting to see how they show up because um, you do have some bears that are primarily terrestrial and some other bears that are much, much more arboreal. So it will be interesting to see how, how those fall apart with the sloths. I just haven't, I haven't done it yet. OK. 
Okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs>